Most demolition companies were started with the simple aim of providing for the founder and his or her family. And as the company grows, that founder's actions will likely provide employment for others. Acts of altruism may follow. That founder might join a trade association to help improve the industry's standards. That founder might put his or her weight and money behind a charitable campaign. That founder might wield his influence to bring about positive change in a number of different ways. However, the fact is most, if not all, demolition companies were, were and are started to put food on the table and a roof over the heads of that founder's family. And if that founder plays his cards right, if the economic gods continue to smile upon him, and if he and his workers manage to avoid accidents and fatalities, that demolition company has the potential to look after the founder into his dotage and may well take care of future generations as well. But there will come a time when enough really is enough. A time when that founder has enjoyed all the trappings that a successful life in demolition might bring. He has the nice house, the nice car and the fancy watch. He's respected by his peers. He has, re he has reached the pinnacle of his chosen career. But what then? For those fortunate or unfortunate enough, depending on your viewpoint, to have family to carry on the business into the future, this might mean a slow easing into a well-earned well -earned retirement. Five o'clock starts become eight o'clock starts. Six day weeks become four and three day weeks. The golf handicap gets a much needed and more regular attention. For those not blessed with sons, daughters, nieces or nephews to carry the business into the future, and even for some of those that have potential successes that are less keen on the demolition business, the exit strategy might not be quite so straightforward. In that instance, the best you might hope for is to sell the company as a going concern to a third party and effectively get out while the going's good. That, in effect, is precisely what David Clark has done at Clark Demolition Company, or CDC as it's better known. As we reported exclusively on Demolition News and in episode 41 of Demolition News Radio, CDC has been acquired by True7, the company behind Trucks Are Us and the Tippers Are Us brands. David Clark is staying on, as are all his staff, but there will come a time when he can walk away from the company started by his father, head held high, safe in the knowledge that his team retain their jobs and that his family are looked after. And frankly, who would blame him? Like many demolition firms, CDC has had its ups and downs. Indeed, the company folded entirely at one point. David Clark himself has experienced more than his fair share of highs and lows too. He was the president of the National Federation of Demolition Contractors. In fact, he was one of the best and certainly one of the strongest and most vocal NFDC presidents that I worked with during my time with the Federation. But he has also fought off bowel cancer and while externally at least he looks unchanged, any battle with cancer will take its toll on even the toughest of men. When he does decide to hand over the reins entirely to someone within the True Seven organisation, no one will blame him. And his exit, whenever that comes, will certainly not be the last. We'll be right back after this. Even without outside influences such as bowel cancer and a failed business, demolition is a brutal industry within which to pursue a career and a livelihood. Regardless of how well you do your job, your cash flow and income hinges upon the willingness, or otherwise, of your client to pay you. You can train men and women to and beyond the legal requirements, but if one of them makes a mistake and someone is hurt or killed, it's you that will be in the firing line. Legislation is constantly shifting. In fact, it often seems that legislators are moving the goalposts merely to catch you out. You will see less and less of your family as your business develops. Early starts to check on site progress, late nights pressing the flesh with potential and existing clients are all part of the territory. It's little wonder that people medicate with cigarettes and alcohol just to make it through the day. Demolition really is not for the faint of heart. I am told regularly that the fun has gone out of the business. As one well-known and well-respected demolition man put it to me recently, this is not what I signed up for. In all my time reporting on demolition, I can't remember a time in which there were so many rumours about companies being up for sale. And who would blame them? There must surely come a time when you've proved your point. You've achieved all that you set out to achieve, and the potential downside of life in the demolition fast lane just becomes too much to bear. I can relate. Several years ago, 
I was approached, twice in fact, about the potential acquisition of demolitionnews.com. One of those approaches was a little more than a sounding out, a kite flying exercise by a lowly representative of a, lo of a larger publishing company. The second was far more serious. Meetings took place, and I'd even gone to the trouble of having somebody actually place a value upon this dog and pony show. But two things happened. First of all, the recession proved to be far deeper than anyone dared contemplate. Even though that didn't sink the acquisition entirely, it dented the price like a well-aimed iceberg. The biggest reason it didn't happen, however, was entirely of my own making. At the time, demolitionnews.com was well established, but demolitionjobs.co.uk was still in its infancy. Demolition Magazine was still in start-up mode, and both Demolition TV and Demolition News Radio lurked unseen beyond the horizon. But I was unwilling to hand it all over when there was still work to be done. Part of the plan was that I would be retained in an advisory role, which, as anyone that knows me would testify, would not sit well with me. Ideas and innovations like Demolition TV and Demolition News Radio were created on the fly. In fact, I decided to do Demolition News Radio at about 6.30 one evening, and the first show went live less than 12 hours later. A consultant or an employee within a large publishing company would not be afforded the luxury of such creative freedom. Anyway, as it transpired, we couldn't reach an agreement, and as the recession tightened its grip on the construction and demolition sectors and on their respective advertising spend, discussions reached a terminal impasse. I think about that a lot. Had I been less of an idealist, I might be semi-retired by now. I don't play golf, but it's fair to say that the fishing rods would have received a more regular airing. Had I been able to silence the entrepreneurial voice in my head, I might have taken the money, worked out my notice, and left demolition news to become someone else's problem. Had the recession not impacted so negatively on the sale price, I might be sat on the beach right now, rather than waking up at 5.30 in the morning to record a daily podcast. Do I regret my decision? Maybe a little. Although I'm proud of what we've achieved since that offer was on the table. So what would happen if that offer or one like it reared its head now? I'd snatch their bloody hand off. Thanks for listening.